Cars, a copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Fresno County Sheriff's Office calling all cars. Attention all cars, broadcast 145. Be on the lookout for James Kipp, described as an Indian. About 33 years, 5 feet 6 inches, 150 pounds. This man has been missing for eight days, and that's all. mountainous regions of California, Arizona, and Nevada, the work of the city police is taken over by the county sheriffs and their deputies. Relentlessly, the never-ending manhunt goes on through the dark streets and alleys of the cities, through the dangerous mountain roads and the trackless desert, where desperadoes hide from the officers of the law. To ensure their victory in the chase, police and sheriff's forces use the finest gasoline they can buy. Isn't it significant that more of these police and emergency cars are powered by Rio Grande cracked gasoline than by any other brand? Everywhere it is sold, in city, mountains, or desert, Rio Grande cracked gasoline is preferred above all other brands by the police, fire, and emergency cars. Your law enforcement officials can't afford to risk gasoline trouble. It would be fatal to have starting trouble, to have a carbon-clogged engine, or a fouled spark plug during the chase of a fleeing criminal. Emergencies arise every day in the operation of police and sheriff's cars. Emergencies when every second counts and desperate drivers call upon their cars for every bit of speed and power possible. That's when Rio Grande cracked gasoline delivers the performance which has won its preference with the officials of so many cities and counties in the West. You can get the same police car performance in your own car by specifying the same gasoline emergency cars used, Rio Grande cracked. And now it is our great pleasure to present Sheriff George Overholt of Fresno County. Sheriff Overholt. Good evening. There are two elements always, almost always found in murder cases. First, the killer's own conscience, and second, his desire to cover up his movements. And in a great many cases, it is one of these two things that traps him. In the story you will hear tonight, both of these elements were highly instrumental in bringing the original crime to light and eventually placing the murderer in our hands. Had the killer not made the mistake of trying to cover up certain bits of evidence that he thought were dangerous to him, it might have been months or even years before the crime was discovered and the chance of our locating the man who did it would have been pretty slim. However, as you will hear, his own fear of the law led him to make a mistake that in the end cost him his life on the gallows. On a hot summer evening in 1932, Al Fuller, postmaster of Seville in Tulare County, California, and his partner Jim Kipp, a one-legged Indian, are just closing up shop when Mrs. Fuller comes in. What a day. Oh, what a day. Yeah, it's been a scorcher, all right. It'll be just as hot all night. Al, how about driving me up into the hills away so I can get a breath of cool air? <laughs> Not me. I'm fagged out. It's a cold bottle of home brew in bed for me. Oh, please, honey. We wouldn't go far. I said no. Didn't you hear me? Yeah, I heard you. Jim? Yes, Edna? Will you drive up in the hills with me? Why, sure. I'd be glad to. Thanks, Jim. How soon will you be ready? Oh, in a few minutes. Uh, just as soon as I get these crates outside. Here, let me open the door for you. Oh, thanks, Edna. Al, you shouldn't let that poor boy do that heavy work. Look at him, pegging along on that crutch, trying to stack those heavy boxes. Afraid it'll tire him out too much for his ride up into the hills? Al, what do you mean? You think I'm blind? You think I don't know what's going on? That poor boy says you licking your lips. I'll be glad to go for a ride with you, says he, losing his breath. Think I'm going to let you get away with that? Oh, yeah, you're crazy. I've never been with Jim a minute that you haven't been there. And you're not going to start now. I asked you to take me out for a breath of air. You refused. So you figured that gave you the right to go off with that dirty one-legged Indian, huh? Well, he's your partner and your friend. Yeah, he's still a wife-stealing Indian. I won't stand here and let you talk about him like that. Oh, you won't, eh? And what are you going to do to stop me, you tramp? <laughs> That's just a sample. 
Let me see you make an eye at that red skin and I'll break every bone in your body. <laughs> Edna, are you? Why, Edna, what's the matter? Al, hit me again. They accused you and me of... Why? Why not? No, Jim. Don't do anything about it. If that's what he thinks, let him think it. He's hit me for the last time. What do you mean? I'm leaving, Jim. Where are you going? I don't know. To Fresno, I guess. I earned my living before I met Al. I can sling hash again. Oh. <laughs> I'll miss you, Edna. You've been mighty nice to me. Uh, he doesn't understand that. He doesn't know that a man and a woman can be just friends. Jim, Jim, I want you to forget about this. You and him are partners. You've got all your money invested in this place with him. Just forget about what he said and go on like nothing has happened at all. Will you promise me that? Uh, he ought to have his eyes black for talking about you like that. Yeah, but people like him don't get their eyes black. They get by with the stuff they pull. Yes. At least they don't get their eyes blacked by Indians with one leg. You'll get what's coming to him someday. You just wait and see. Edna moves to Fresno. And Jim, on his frequent trips to town, never fails to drop in for a friendly chat. Then one day, not Jim, but Al drops in. Hello, Sugar. Al, what do you want? What's the matter? Ain't you glad to see your husband? Sure, sure. I, uh, I want to apologize for what I did that night, honey. I'm sorry. It's all right, Al. I forgive you. Thanks, kid. I don't know, maybe it was the heat or something that made me go wild that night. Well, I guess we might as well forget it, Al. How's everything down at Seville? Not so good, Edna. Store burned down the other night. Oh, Al, no. Yeah. Lost everything. But you had insurance. Yeah. Well, what are you going to do about the mail? I'm still handling it. Set up over at Pop Andrews temporarily. Going to get another place? I don't know. I suppose so. How's Jim taking it? All right. Say, Edna, how about taking a little ride with me? Where to? Oh, up the valley away. Well, all right. Come on. Wait till I get my hat. Oh, you don't need a hat. We'll only go as far as Madeira. All right, then. Let's go. Why, Al, this is Jim's car. Yeah. Was your car burned up in the fire? No, it's all right. I just borrowed Jim's car for today. Come on, hop in. Half an hour later, Al pulls into a garage in Madeira, parks the car at the back, opens the door for Edna. Come on, Edna. This is as far as we go. What do you mean? Give me a check for this car, will you, buddy? Yes, sir. How long will you be in? Overnight? Yes, sir. That'll be 35 cents. Oh. Here you are. Keep the change. Don't let anybody monkey around the car. Yes, sir. Thank you. What's the idea, Al? i got to get back to Fresno. i got to go to work in half an hour. I'll get you back if you'll stop the gab. How? By bus. There's one leaving in five minutes. But I don't understand. You don't have to. Come on. The next day, Al calls for Edna again, forces her to accompany him to Madeira, this time in his own car. When they arrive, he parks around the corner, and the two of them walk toward the garage. Oh, wait a minute, Al. you got to tell me what this is all about. Listen, you'll be better off if you keep your mouth shut. But where are you going now with Jim's car? We're going to drive it to Merced and leave it there tonight. How do we get back from Merced? We're going to take a stage back here and pick up my car and go on to Fresno. But why, Al? What are you moving Jim's car north for? Where's Jim? What's he say about this? Listen, Sugar, do you want another pat over the kisser? Now, you're doing as I say. There's something funny about this. Well, it's none of your business. You're doing as I say. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm not going to do any dirty work for you. What do you mean, dirty work? I'll... Oh, no, you won't, Al. You lift a hand to me and I'll have you put in jail this time. Cocky, ain't you? Maybe. But if you think you can make me a party to anything as shady as this looks, you got another thing coming. Al, what have you done to Jim? Jim? I don't know anything about Jim. He walked out on me. That ain't true, Al. If he'd done that, he'd have told me so. Oh, he'd have told you, huh? You two are still at it, huh? I might have known that. Oh, you're disgusting. Wait a minute. Where are you going? 
Back to Fresno. You keep your mouth shut. You're not worth talking about. But Edna feels that Jim is worth talking about. After a sleepless night of weary, she takes her problem and her suspicion to the district attorney, tells him the story. So that's all I know about it, sir, but it doesn't sound right. Him moving Jim's car north by short jumps and Jim never showing up for more than two weeks now. Well, what do you think he might have done to this Jim Kip? I don't know, but Al's capable of doing anything low and mean. I might have murdered him and thrown his... What? Al was a partner with a fellow in a mine up near Raymond a couple of years ago. I was up there with him one day, and we were looking down an old mine shaft. Al dropped a rock down it, and after a long time, we heard it splash in the water in the bottom. And I looked at me sort of funny-like and said, this would be a good place to do away with a person. Mm, you think this husband of yours would do such a thing? Of course he would. Well, we'll investigate the matter and try to locate Mr. Kipp. In the meantime, please don't mention this to anyone, especially to your husband if you see him. Don't worry, I... I won't. The district attorney asks the assistance of the sheriff of Tulare County in checking up the background of Al Fuller and the whereabouts of Jim Kibben. He requests the sheriff of Madera County to ascertain the truth of Edna's statement regarding the moving of the car. When the officers are ready to report... They meet in the office of Sheriff Overholt of Fresno County. I've asked you boys to meet me here in George's office so he can hear the result of your investigation. And if we have any proof that a crime has been committed, we can possibly discover in whose jurisdiction the case lies. Now, um, what did you find out, Sheriff Rhodes? The girl's story is straight enough. A man who answers the description you gave me of Fuller left a Ford sedan. License number 6D721 in the Western Garage last Tuesday. He was accompanied by a woman answering the description of Edna Fuller. He picked up the car the next day, but the woman had left him after some angry words before they went into the garage. I did a little checking up in Merced and found the garage where the car had been left on Wednesday night. Now, my hunch is that we can trace the car right on up to Oakland or San Francisco. He probably stopped Thursday at Modesto. Good. Uh, now, how about Tulare County? What did you find down there? Well, Kip hasn't been seen since the night before Fuller's store burned down. We haven't any evidence of arson, but... Here, look at this. What's that? The insurance paper's on the store. Made out to both Kip and Fuller. Kip's signature is a forgery. Apparently executed by Fuller. Uh, here. Here's an example of Kip's true signature. I should say that's a better motive than Mrs. Fuller's more self-satisfying story of jealousy. No question about it. $10,000 worth of insurance. Well... You have a case of arson and forgery against Fuller in Tulare County. And you, Dusty, have a case of grand theft of the auto against him in Madeira County. Uh, we've got to find the body now and find out who has the murder case against him. George, I think as sheriff of Fresno County, you've got the problem of finding the body. Okay with me, but what have you to go on? Mrs. Fuller told me about a mine up near Raymond. Well, uh, Fuller was interested in, he remarked to her how easy it would be to dispose of a body in one of the abandoned pipes up there. That's worth looking into. You bet it is. I suggest you get Mrs. Fuller to go along with you. Possibly she can find the place again. Okay, I'll get on it right away. Accompanied by Mrs. Overholt and under Sheriff Jack Tarr, Sheriff Overholt and Mrs. Fuller leave Fresno late in the afternoon. The sun has set by the time they reach Raymond, and it is dark when they arrive at the point which Mrs. Fuller believes is nearest the mine. The party leaves the car, and their way, lit by flashlights, scramble up the steep rise toward an abandoned mine, the gaunt machinery of which is starkly silhouetted against the star-spangled sky like a gibbet for the moon. I, I don't like this, Sheriff. I, I'm, I'm afraid. Well, there's nothing to be afraid of, Mrs. Fuller. You don't know Al Fuller. He's a killer. What makes you so sure of that? I got a good idea he killed a bank clerk in a hold-up back east somewhere. He was drunk one night and boasted about murdering a section hand in Macon, Georgia. He threatened me if I talked. Oh, I shouldn't have said anything about this. Now, listen to me, Mrs. Fuller. You've done exactly the right thing. Especially if this man has committed such crimes before. I did it because of Jim Kipp. Oh, please understand, Sheriff. There was never anything between us, but he needed sympathy and understanding. That's what I gave him. That's what he gave me. I understand. And now we're looking for his grave. And if we find it, 
Oh, he'll be looking for mine soon. Oh, Mrs. Fuller, be sensible. No, I know it. Al'll kill me. I know he will. I. Well, what's the matter? Something just wished I me. I'm like a ghost. I gotta get out of here. I can't stand it. I gotta get well, out of it's here. It's only a branch of a tree. Oh, Jim's gone. Oh, God, I know him. Save me. Save me. Save me. Well, Jack, we can't get anything out of her tonight, that's sure. We'd better take her back to town, George. We know the general location of the place. We can come back here later and look for the body. All right. But I think the next step is to arrest Fuller. I'm more convinced than ever that we've got a murder case on our hands. The next day at a bootlegging joint in Fresno, Jack Tarr is talking to the bartender. Know a fellow by the name of Al Fuller, Pete? Sure. You been around lately? Yeah. He's out in the back room now playing the slot machine. Thanks. I want to talk to him. Tough luck, buddy. You'd have had a jackpot if that baby hadn't slipped a notch. Yeah, well, I'll knock it over this time. Yeah, what did I tell you, huh? Quite a jackpot, but not bad. Yeah, I'll get it yet. I'm not so sure of that. What do you mean? This is one time you're going to walk out with your winnings. What the devil are you talking about? You're under arrest. What for? Suspicion of murder. (laughs) You got the wrong guy. Who are you looking for? Al Fuller. Well, you got the wrong guy, I tell you. I'm not. Stick out your hands. With Fuller safely lodged in the county jail, Sheriff Overholt leads a posse over the hills near Raymond, searching for the body of Jim Kipp. Several days go by, and nothing is discovered. Finally, one day when he returns discouraged to his office, the sheriff is met by Fuller's attorney. Now, look here, Sheriff. You've got to let my client loose. Why? Well, you know why. You've got him charged with murder. And you haven't proven the corpus delecti. You've got to have a case, and you know it. You can't keep a man in jail indefinitely like this. It just ain't constitutional. I'll get the corpus delecti. Yeah, and I'll get Fuller sprung. I'm going to file a suit for habeas corpus and make you let him go. And you can't do a thing to stop me. Go ahead. Do anything you like. But I'm going to send Fuller up for murder. Well, we'll just see about that. Good day. Well, he's right, though, Sheriff. Of course he's right. If we can't find that body, we can't keep Fuller in jail. But I'm morally certain that he's the murderer. So am I. But if that lawyer of his ever gets the habeas corpus, Fuller will beat the country. Listen, that wife of his has a convenient memory. She may have remembered some more things about that dear husband. Get her over here. I want to go to work on her. Mrs. Fuller, I'm afraid we've got to release your husband. Why? Why? He's guilty. I know he is. I feel he is, too, Mrs. Fuller. But unfortunately, we have so far been unable to prove that a crime has been committed. So when his attorney obtains the necessary court order, we'll have to release him. Now, what I asked you to come over here for was to arrange for the necessary bodyguard for you. Bodyguard? For me? Well, what do you mean? Well, naturally, your husband knows that his arrest came about because you told the authorities your story. Now, I'm afraid once he's at liberty, he will attempt to get his revenge on you. And our job is to prevent crime as well as solve them. Oh, don't let him out, Sheriff. Please, for the love of heaven, don't he'll kill me. Bodyguard or no bodyguard, he'll kill me. I'm afraid we have no choice in the matter but to release him. Isn't there some way? Well, of course, if he committed a crime of any kind in Fresno for which we could hold him, it would be different. But apparently, the only thing we have on him is the suspicion of this murder. Oh, but he did commit other crimes. He held up Johnny Schroeder's pool hall. Oh, he did? Yeah, he did that job. He told me all about it. Why didn't you tell us that before? Why... I don't know. I didn't want to squeal on him too much. Sometimes it's the safest course, Mrs. Fuller. I I feel like an awful heel, Sheriff. Well, if you'll think how you've just saved your neck, that feeling will pass. Thank you very much, Mrs. Fuller. You're welcome. I'll call you when I want to talk to you again. Yes, sir. Pretty smart, Sheriff. Pretty smart. They never did have a suspect on that Schroeder holdup. Fuller will do beautifully. That was a city case. We'll lend our prisoner to the police department until we find that body. Hello? Chief? This is George Overholt. Listen, I've got a suspect on that Schroeder holdup. Yeah, Fuller. The same guy I've got in on suspicion of murder. Well, listen, will you make out a warrant for robbery against him and hold him as your prisoner for a while? Yeah, I'm beating a smart lawyer with a habeas corpus at his own game. Thanks. With Al Fuller safely and permanently jailed, awaiting trial for the Schroeder robbery. With Fresno police building a case against him on that crime, 
Sheriff Overholt and his posse renew their search for the corpus delicti of Fuller's greater crime. Then, one day, as the sheriff and Jack Tarr are climbing a hill back of Raymond. Certainly is a needle in the haystack job, Sheriff. These hills are pitted with old mine shafts. We could work out here for six months and never get any closer to a solution. You'd have to go down every one of these pipes to be sure a body had been thrown in them. Not every one, Jack. I have a hunch on this one. There's something down there. Let's take a look. I'll take a look. No. No, it's too deep to see anything. Yeah, might be a cow down there. Might be, but cows don't drive up to mine shafts in automobiles. What do you mean? Look at those tracks. The car came in here, stopped, then drove away. When it drove away, it drove fast. Look at the way it kicked up the dirt, making this turn. Come on. Where are we going? Back to Raymond to get a hard rock miner and some tackle to go down this shaft. Back in Raymond, the sheriff enlists the professional assistance of an old prospector. And while he is assembling and loading his gear, Overholt and Tar drop into a beanery for a sandwich and a cup of coffee. Would you like some pie with the coffee, gentlemen? No, I don't think so. How about you, Jake? Yeah, I'll have a piece of apple pie. Apple pie coming up! Hey, buddy, we're looking for a guy. Yeah? Did you ever see a fellow like this picture come through here? Well, let me see, let me see. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, he had some chili in here one day. How long ago? Oh, uh, about... Two weeks ago. Yeah, I, I remember him because there was a one-legged guy with him. Yeah, one-legged guy. He looked like an Indian. Are you sure? Yeah, positive. This is too good to be true. What time of day was it, do you recall? I guess it was around 4.30 when they left, yeah. Funny thing, too, about 20 minutes later, I saw this guy on this picture come down the road like a bat out of Hades. Only he was alone. He didn't have the Indian with him. Well, I guess that cinches the deal, Jack. Come on, let's get back to that mine. <laughs> Working in the glare of automobile headlights, the miner, with the willing assistance of the deputy sheriffs, assembles the windlass, and with two men slowly paying out the line, starts the descent into the deep. I'm sure that's a job I wouldn't want. (laughs) Oh, it's bad enough up here. Hey, you said it. It certainly is a deep shaft. What did you say? Yes, he found it. You can hardly see his light down there. Must be forty feet. Pretty dark down there. Oh, man, all the way. He's found something. Found it. What's the matter? Uh, a couple of more things you want. His cut and his hat. Aye, that was him. Right. That was him. Oh, okay, take it away. Easy, Johnson. Easy, Johnson. Easy, Johnson. Stand by to give him a hand. He gets the surface, boys. All right, all right. Here he is. Swing ah, it take it easy, boys. Don't drop him. I don't want to have to go back down there again. Get him under the shoulders. Get him under the shoulders. Let's have a look at this. Get him under the shoulders. Hard to tell anything. He's been down there for long, but he's got only one leg. Let's see if there's any identification in his pocket. Yeah, well. Here are a couple of papers. Mm-hmm. Some bills made out to Jim Kipp. Well, boys, I guess we've got our corpus delicti all right. Oh, yes, doctor, come in. I've just completed my autopsy on that body you brought in last night. Yes? Death was caused by drowning. By drowning? Exactly. The man was hit on the head by a sharp instrument which fractured his skull, but... That didn't kill him. How do you know? His lungs were full of water. Then Fuller beat him over the head, knocked him unconscious, and then dumped him in the shaft, throwing his crutch and hat after him. Well, Jack. Yes, sir? Bring Fuller down here. I want to talk to him. Sit down, Fuller. What are you after me again for, Sheriff? I'm being held for the city cops. We found Jim Kipp's body last night, Fuller. His body? What happened to him? You murdered him. <laughs> oh, no, not me. You got the wrong guy. Fuller, you drove Jim Kipp up to Raymond. You had a bowl of chili at a lunchroom there. You left Raymond about 4.30. You drove that boy up to a mine shaft three miles out of town. You hit him over the head with a miner's pick and dumped his body in the shaft. That happened at 4.45, which was the time his watch stopped when he hit the water in the bottom of the shaft. Then you backed your car out of there fast and raced back down the road. You went through Raymond five minutes later at 50 miles an hour. Your motive in committing this crime was to get the complete insurance on your store, which you set fire to yourself the same night you murdered Kip. Well, have I made any mistakes so far, Fuller? It was him or me. What do you mean by that? 
He wanted me to go up there and look at a mine with him. When we got there, he said he was in love with Edna. And I had to get out. I said a couple of things to him, and he said he'd brought me up there to kill me. Then he drew his crutch back over his shoulder and started to swing at me with it. I picked up an old pick that was lying up there and tried to knock the crutch out of his hand. I I hit him with a pick, and he went down, dead. Well, I was, I, I was scared. I, I didn't know what to do, so I dumped him in the shaft, crutch and hat, pick and all. Aside from the fact that he wasn't dead when he hit the water, there's another point I'd like to clear up. Just stand over there in the middle of the room, Fuller. Oh, away from the desk in the chairs. Oh, yeah? That's right. Now, what shoulder did he draw the crutch back over? His left. Are you sure of that? Yeah. And he swung it at you before you could defend yourself? Yeah, a couple of times. All right, take this ruler, Fuller. Imagine it's a crutch. Now stand on your left leg. Uh, what's all this for? I just want to corroborate your story. Kip's right leg was missing, so stand on your left as he did. That's right. Now swing that ruler over your left shoulder and back toward me, just as he did. Go ahead. Oh, boy. <laughs> you see, Fuller, it'd be quite impossible for a one-legged man to swing a crutch with murderous intent. He'd throw himself off balance and fall down, just as you did now. Oh, dirty rat. Al Fuller's weak story was blasted full of holes by the concerted efforts of the boys of my office and the sheriffs of Tulare and Madera counties. We brought him to trial and we won our case. The jury found him guilty and he sentenced him to hang in San Quentin prison. Thank you, Sheriff Overholt. Ladies and gentlemen, today a new issue of the Calling All Cars News is displayed everywhere Rio Grande cracked gasoline is sold. And in the next few days, a half million motorists will drive in to get a free copy of the news. Have you ever read this interesting publication of crime news, true detective stories, movie and radio news? You'll enjoy this latest issue, and we urge you to drive into the Rio Grande station in your neighborhood and ask for your free copy. If you have a boy or girl in your family, they'll be thrilled to read how easily they can get a junior detective outfit of 14 valuable articles, all free. As you drive in your car tomorrow, just notice the number of service stations featuring Rio Grande cracked gasoline. These are all independent stations, free to choose any gasoline or oil they wish to sell. And as proof of the greater value in the Rio Grande products, we point to our rapidly increasing army of independent dealers. Only by offering you better gasoline and better oil can the independent service station hope to win and hold your trade. And by featuring Sinclair Motor Oil, the independent dealer guarantees his customers against motor trouble from oil breakdown. Sinclair Motor Oils have won a worldwide reputation for quality. Every Rio Grande cracked gasoline dealer is qualified to tell you exactly what grade of Sinclair oil or lubricant is needed for every part of your car and to give you scientific lubrication according to your own car manufacturer's specifications. 